We're in Esther. We're in the book of Esther. So if you uh, if you need to get there, want to get there in your Bibles, we'll be in chapter two. I hope I hope you all had a good time. I don't know, how how many of you guys talking to all these adults in here? How many of you guys dressed up for Halloween? Who's the real kids out there? There you go. <laughs> um, yeah. So Halloween was last week. I hope you all had a lot of fun. We had our annual trunk or treat, but we had it indoors for the second year. You know the I don't know if it's me, but since we've been here, it's always been inside because of the rain. So I'm sorry if it's my fault. I don't know if it is or not, but but we did have a good turnout. We need to come up with like another name instead of trunk or treat. Like what do you call it when it's inside? Like door or treat? It just doesn't have the same, doesn't ring as well. But uh, we had a great turnout. I mean, I, there wasn't like a count done or anything, but I know when I left where we were handing out candy after pretty much everybody had gone through and I came in here, this auditorium was full of people. Uh, there was probably, I think at least probably 100 people were here, lots of friends of y'all's. It was great to meet uh, several of them and see them. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it's pretty cool. Just, it's pretty cool when you do something and, uh, uh, and, and people show up. You know, people come to it. People are excited about it. Hopefully they're blessed by it. And I know there's a lot of controversy on Halloween from a Christian standpoint and how some people uh, feel about it. But our goal here is to try to bless people, and if we can do that by blessing their children with a little bit of uh, good-hearted fun, then, then that's okay. You know, there's actually some similarities between Halloween and Esther's story. We'll get into that in, in a little bit. Last week we learned that Esther lives in a very ungodly world, this, uh, this world that's dominated by the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire is the one and only superpower of the day. And it's ruled by a king by the name of Xerxes, who is a power-hungry, show-off, drunken bully. I don't even know if bully is the right word because he's kind of a pushover. So, but he, it's, it's led by this guy that's not the greatest guy to be, you know, to be led by. Uh, and he likes to show off his riches and his power, even to the extent of at this. They had the six-month-long feast followed by a week-long after-party, and he likes to show off his power and his authority over other people so much to the point that he asks his wife, Queen Vashti, to do something inappropriate. We're not, you know, exactly sure the full picture of that, but he asks her to do something inappropriate, and after refusing. Queen Vashti is dethroned and discarded. She, she will not comply with whatever his inappropriate request is, and so basically she's kicked to the curb. She's thrown to the side. She's deemed to be worthless in many ways. And at this point in the story, that's all of chapter 1 that we talked about last week, Esther, whom the book is named after, hasn't even been mentioned. She hasn't even come into the story yet, and that's what we're going we're gonna to do this morning. We'll get to meet her. And we're going to read through a bulk of chapter 2. I've, I've summarized and cut out some of the, call it the boring parts or whatever you want to call it in the middle. But we're going to read the bulk of chapter 2. And while I'm reading, if you're following along, and while you're reading along, see if you can find the similarities between Esther and Halloween. Okay? I said that a minute ago. Similarities between Esther and Halloween. Let's see if you can see or notice what is similar about the two. So we're in Esther chapter 2 at... Verse 1, later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants made a proposition. They said, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Then... Let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Let the young woman... So they're going to go get all these young virgin girls and they're going to haul them all up to the, the palace and the king's going to get to have his fun with them. And whichever one he likes the best and thinks is the most fun, I don't, you know, I, who knows, um, that's the person that's going to become queen. This might not come as a surprise to you if you were here last week. This advice appealed to the king, and so he followed it. He's like, this is a great idea. Again, not the best king in the world, 
not the best society in the world, but it is the world that Esther lives in. This is how we're going to pick the next queen. Any of y'all seen The Bachelor? This is the very first episode of The Bachelor. They're just going to get all these girls together. And we'll, we'll find out here in a little bit that they're each going to spend a night with the king. And that's how we're going to decide who his next wife is, the next queen is. Verse uh, 5. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish. And just forgive me if I pronounce any of those names wrong. Like if you know how to pronounce it, just that you get an extra gold sticker this morning. Um, so he's the great-grandson of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. So, super quick history lesson. Uh, the, the nation of Israel had been divided into two kingdoms. There's a northern kingdom who had been carried away sometime before by the Assyrians. It was populated by ten of the twelve tribes. Uh, if you've ever heard of the lost tribes of Israel, that would be those people. They went away to Assyria, and we have never heard from them again. Any of them, ever. Don't even know where they went. The southern kingdom, Judah, included the capital city of Jerusalem, today's Jerusalem, and it had two tribes, one of those being the tribe of Benjamin. King Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonians came and captured them and took them away. So there was this world power, the Assyrians, who took the northern kingdom. And then a bigger world power, the Babylonians, came and took all of them and the southern kingdom. And then later, the Persians came and conquered all of them. You following me? So there's one superpower in the world, it's Persia. But before that was the superpower, Babylon. And that's why Mordecai, for some reason, doesn't live in Jerusalem because his great-grandfather was taken away by a previous conquest. Okay? So Mordecai, verse 7, had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother, mother died. When the king's order... An edict had been proclaimed, this one about bringing all these young virgins to the palace. Esther, along with many other young women, was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai the eunuch, who had charge of the harem. And she pleased him and won his favor. There's very much in this part about Esther's story. We're not going to go into detail this morning. That's kind of similar to Joseph. Remember, Joseph was in slavery and he won Potiphar's favor, and he became in charge of the household. Uh, later, he's in prison, and he did well in prison and won the respect of the, at least the prison guards to where he became in charge of the prison. Later, he ends up in charge of all of Egypt. So there's something about Joseph's story that's kind of similar here. It's probably that way on purpose. So she also began to win favor with people, specifically uh, Haggai, this eunuch who was in charge of the harem. Esther, verse 10, had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. And every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening with her. Verse 13, and now, and this, excuse me, and this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. I don't ever go into detail about what that might have been. Verse 14, in the evening, this is important, in the evening she would go there and in the morning return. She would return to another part of the harem to the care of, we'll call this guy Shaq, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. And get this, she would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned by name. So she would go in at night Come back out in the morning. And this was happening with all of these girls that were taken up to the palace. They would go in at night. One night is basically a one night stand beauty pageant with the king and then go back out in the morning. And that girl would never be called on again unless something about her was 
special or something that the king thought he would call them back. Verse 15 and 16, when the turn came for Esther, she was taken to King Xerxes. Verse 17, now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he sat a royal crown on her head, he made her queen instead of Vashti, and the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberty. Let me ask you, did you catch it? Did you catch the similarities between Halloween and the story of Esther? It has to do with Esther's identity. Notice that she has two names. One name is Hadassah. The other name is Esther. We've got Hadassah and we've got Esther. One name reveals her true identity. The other name conceals it. One name identifies her as Jewish. The other name identifies her as Persian. Hadassah is her Jewish name. Esther is her Persian name. And so her true identity, her Jewish identity, is kept hidden by her Persian name and her Persian identity. Hadassah, who we call Esther and who prefers to go by the name Esther, is wearing a mask. And she's wearing a mask because, well, that's an interesting question. Why is she wearing a mask? Not exactly 100% sure, but in either case, she is Jewish, but she chooses to live as a Persian. She is Jewish. That is her true and real identity, but she chooses to live as a Persian. This is important in the Esther story because if, if we miss this fact, If we miss this fact that Esther is deciding to wear a mask, then what we can do is put Esther probably on too high of a pedestal than she might deserve. I'm not trying to talk bad about Esther. I don't really know Esther. All I've got is what the Bible's given us. But we we could tend to elevate her to this place of, wow, you know, Esther's so awesome and so awesome and so awesome. Maybe she's not that awesome. I mean, she's, she's great. I mean, she has her moments... She has her good moments, but she doesn't always live the life or demonstrate the behavior of a mature person of God. And all this is supported by and even encouraged by her father figure, Mordecai. So at a minimum, Mordecai and Esther have some kind of moral compromise when it comes to their identity. And that's important in the Esther story, and we'll, we'll get there in future weeks, but, but I need you to know and I need you to realize that Esther is not dramatically different than you and I. Sometimes, you know, we get these biblical characters and we say, oh, they're so awesome. They're so great. Look at all the wonderful, great, and awesome things they did. They never did anything wrong. Well, maybe a few little tiny things, but most of it was all awesome. No, they were a lot like you and I. And the similarities don't end there because there are similarities between Esther's story and ours. We live in a fallen and broken world and in many ways, an ungodly world. A world where the powerful prey on the weak. A world where social standards contrast with God's standards. A world where success is sought through wealth and power, and sexuality, and beauty. I mean, we can read this story and go, "Woo! I'm glad I don't live in a world like that. Do we? I think there's more similarities here than we might realize sometimes. Do you hear them? We live in an ungodly world. We live in a world where the standards of society and really sometimes our own standards, frequently contrast with God's. We live in a world where people seek power through wealth, through beauty, through sexuality, and many times the powerful prey on the weak. 
And in the midst of Esther's ungodly world, the identity she chooses is one that conceals who she really is. The identity she chooses is an identity of the world. And just like Esther, we too frequently are guilty of hiding our true identity. Like Halloween, we put on a mask. But we don't do it for fun just to get some candy. Well, maybe we do. We, we put on a mask and there's some kind of reason behind it. And, and just to, to help you come to grasp with this, because as, as I was thinking about this, I was kind of like, well, that's not me. That, is it me? I hope it's not. And I started to think, well, maybe it is me. Because how it works is that we, we go, you know what, today... Today I'm going to put on a mask and I'm going to be somebody different. That's, that's not how it works in our, in our minds. We don't, um, we don't stop being Christian, right? We say, well, no, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. We don't stop being Christian, but we begin to discard Christian morals and Christian ethics and Christian standards. But we still say, I'm a Christian. We just kind of throw some of those things off to the wayside. And maybe we do it for a night of fun or a week of fun life of fun. I don't know. We don't stop believing in God. We just stop trusting in Him. And instead, we seek success based on what society would say. I know, I know God says this, but like, you know, this world's a little bit different. You know, this Bible's really old. It's a little bit different of a world. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a few modifications here so that I can get ahead in life. We also don't stop believing in Jesus. We just Stop following Him when it's not convenient. When it's not convenient, we choose to not follow Jesus. And listen, I'm, I want to be... <laughs> I am not saying any of this to put you on a guilt trip because I am not a guilt motivator. I don't think it's a healthy way to try to motivate anybody. I can say this to you because I'm guilty as well. And I can say this to you, and I can say this to myself, because it's a real question that we need to ask ourselves. Who is, or what is, my true identity? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I going to be? When it comes to Mordecai and Esther's identity choice, honestly, we're only scratching the surface this morning. We're not pondering questions like, why are they even in Persia? Now we might go, well, it was, it was captivity, it was exile, they were taken away. Some 20 or 25 years earlier, 50,000 or so Jews left Persia and went back to Jerusalem because the king allowed them to. The king said, yes, go. Go back. Go rebuild your temple. Go. Go. So why is Mordecai still living in the capital city of Persia? Why did Esther's family, the rest of her family, or her parents before they died, we don't know the situation behind that, why, why are they still in the area? Why didn't they go? Why are Esther and Mordecai still living in Persia when they really don't have to? Why did they choose a Persian identity over a Jewish one? It's unclear, too, in the case of this, this decree about virgins being brought to the, uh, the palace of whether Esther did or did not have a choice in the matter. Um, many times, I know most of my life, I thought, well, Esther didn't have a choice. You know, the king's edict was given, and she was dragged there. But we don't really know that for sure, because the, you know, the text doesn't tell us. It's likely, it's just as plausible that she went there by choice as it is that she went there not by choice. You follow me? It's just as plausible that she went there by choice as... And I honestly feel like it's a little more plausible, and here's why. Because there's nothing in the story that indicates Esther's displeasure with the situation, Esther's fighting against the situation. She never voices a single complaint. Mordecai never voices a single complaint about what's going on. Which is very contrary if you want to read some of Daniel's life, where... That king tried to you know, do this and do this, and, and you know, Daniel made some objections several times. We don't see that in Esther's case. 
Esther puts on her Persian mask to cover up her Jewish identity, and the truth is, in our lives, when it matters, when it really matters, we frequently choose to put on a mask too. We do it to blend in. We do it to fit in. Uh, we do it to be liked, to be accepted. We do it to have some fun. Uh, we do it to get our way. We do it for you know, a variety of reasons. I can't even go into all the reasons why we might do this. But I can tell you that none of these reasons, we don't ever put on a mask to try to honor God. I don't, I don't ever put on a mask to say, you know what, I'm going to do something great for God. Let me hide my identity so nobody knows. I've never done that. I, I put on a mask to go do something that, that I want to do. I never put on a mask to go love my neighbor. I never put on a mask to, to give of myself. And I'm not talking about the not making a big deal about something. Like I might go serve in some way, and I'm like, I'm not going to make a big hoopla about it or whatever. I'm, I'm talking about putting on a mask. Hiding your identity to go do something good. I've had times when I've chosen to conceal my identity. I've had times when I've lived a conflicted life. And in, fortunately, in some cases, I'm sure not all of them, and I'm definitely not putting myself up on a pedestal. I can think of one or two at least. One I talked about a couple of Wednesday nights ago about being in the Navy. But I came to realize one day, it's like, you know what? I'm living two different lives. Which, which one is, is the real me? You know, I noticed this, this double standard, this living one way in some circumstances and living a different way in others. I would be one person at work or at school or out in town, and I'd be a totally different person at home, at church, with my family. And I really sat down and began to look at this, and I'm like, well, what? And I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. I was like, well, which one's the real me? And I came to this point. It's like, I've got to decide. I've got to decide which one, which me, is the real me. And neither of them are an easy choice. You know, they're both laid before us. And there's no one compelling me necessarily to do one or the other. I can do whichever I want. I can be this person, this person of the world, the person that does what they want, the person that... that whatever, or I can try to be this person who follows Jesus. I could be either one. My choice. Yeah, there's peer pressure and there's family pressure, but just as much family pressure is to be this, there's peer pressure to do this. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very much available to us. Both of these choices. Both of these choices are very, very much available to us. Who are we going to be? There is one version of you that is the real you. And there is another version of you that is the Halloween mask. And it's just a question, again, I'm not trying to guilt you, it's just a question that deal, that, that, that deserves some real thought. Because this morning, one of you is present. And you've got to decide who it is. Your Jesus follower identity or your whatever your other identity is. You've got to choose. Which one is present this morning? Which one is the real you? Which one is going to be present at work this week? And which one is the real you? Which one is going to be present Friday night and Saturday night? And which one is going to be real, the real you? Will you love God and will you love others or will you be more interested in loving yourself? Will you partner with God and others to make the world a little bit more the way it should be, the way Jesus would define it, or do you just want to make the world a little bit more the way you want it to be? And again, I think neither choice is necessarily, like, I don't think one choice is necessarily easier than the other. And it kind of depends on what your upbringing was like. But if you choose a life of the world, and if you choose that identity, you're going to get some pressure from your family. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you making these choices? Why are you being this way? But if you choose the life of Christ as your identity, then you're going to get some pressure. Why are you doing this? Why are you... Why are you? So there's pressure on both sides. The choice is yours. 
knowing us, no one forcing you. Again, you might feel this tension, you might feel this pull, but no one is forcing you. But you, only you have to decide who is the real you. Which one is it? We're going to keep going through Esther's story next week in the next several weeks. I think it's important just to recognize and to know and to see that Esther and Mordecai are not spiritual superheroes. They're average people like you and me. And what we're going to find as we go through this story, despite the fact that God is silent and God is not mentioned, that God can and will still use morally corrupted, morally damaged people to still fulfill His good will. And so I'm, I'm saying that because if, you know, if you're like me and you like come to this like realization, it's like, oh, I think I have been wearing a mask. I think I have been, like, this is the person I want to be, but I just keep being this person, and I want to throw off that mask, but it's hard and it's challenging. I get all that. It doesn't mean all hope is lost. Oh, I've just been this terrible person my whole life. There's no reason to change now. No, there's, there's lots of reasons to change now. There's lots of reasons. The number one reason being what Jesus has done for you. All of the junk in your life. All of the terrible mistakes that you've made. All of the things that you have either unknowingly, accidentally, or purposely done to take yourself further away from God has not changed the fact that God is consistently and relentlessly pursuing. And that He took care of the garbage in your life through the blood of Jesus. Available to everyone. Everyone who will stop believing in themselves, I shouldn't use the word believe, faith. They'll stop having faith in themselves, stop trusting themselves more, and start, start trusting God. Dead. To stop putting your faith in what society would say is success and put your faith, put your trust in God. Again, it's not a, it's not a perfect road we're going to walk. I just think we we just gotta choose. We gotta choose. We're gonna trip, we're gonna fall, we're gonna whatever along the way. But we just just I'm gonna leave that with you. Again, I am not trying to guilt you. I am not. If you feel guilt, <laughs> that's that's on you. That is on you. Because I I love you. I love you. I'm messed up, you're messed up, let's all be messed up together, but let's try to work on our messed upness a little bit, okay? <laughs> So let's pray and we'll be done. Spend some time thinking about that. Lord, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for your son. Thank you for loving us, for pursuing us. And Lord, help us to really think about our lives and think about who we really are, where our identity is found, and whether or not we've been wearing a mask. It's a challenge, Lord, if we've been wearing a mask for a long, long time to take that mask off and to try to be the person that we want to be. That mask will keep calling to us. A few times we'll probably put it on again. Help us, help us to take it off, to throw it away, and to be done with it. Help us to be Your people. We want for You to be our God. We thank You for the blood of Jesus, salvation that comes. Help us to seek Him. Help us to walk in a way that follows Him. Show love to you, love to our neighbors. That people might see our true identity even in the toughest times. In Your Son's name we pray. We thank You. Thank you.